Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. With 2021 rapidly coming to an end, it is time for some reflection. What will we remember about this year? How did our lives change? Also, we look forward to the new year. What does 2022 have in store for us? Will we be living in interesting times? Cross-talking 2021, I'm joined by my guest, Jyoti Brower in Bristol. She is deputy leader of the Workers' Party of Britain, as well as author of The Drive to War Against Russia and China. And in Paris, we cross to John Lachlan. He's a university lecturer in history and political philosophy. All right, cross-talk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. John, let me go to you first in, in Paris. Um, how did the neoliberal project, neoliberalism as, as an ideology, fare in 2021? Because uh, I would say it did very, very poorly as it should, because it's an ideology that um, uh, is collapsing all around us in every facet of the, every facet it touches. Go ahead, John. Well, I think 2021 was the year in which the <clears throat> world elites, but I'm not sure that I would call them neoliberal, um, consolidated their grip on power. I'm thinking, of course, of the uh, the beginning of the year when uh, Trump was evicted from the White House and replaced by Joe Biden, who is an expression uh, mm -hmm. a perfect expression of those elites <clears throat> and of their grip on power. But uh, if I question the use of the word ne neoliberal, which I don't think does apply to them, because I don't think they are liberal anymore in any sense, they're not neoliberal or liberal, um, they are instead uh, Marxisto-capitalist. Um, what I mean by that is that there is, uh, and again, this was exemplified at the beginning of the year in January, by the now second appearance of Xi Jinping at the Davos World Economic Forum. He, he originally appeared in 2017 when Trump was elected. This year he appeared again, albeit virtually. And uh, he was welcomed uh, then as before by Klaus Schwab, the head of that forum, who again is a very emblematic figure for these world business elites. And uh, Schwab said to him, you have shown us, Mr. President, the principles which should guide us on our common path. And that phrase expresses this horrible convergence between totalitarian communism of the kind which exists in China, which, as we know, has a very strong capitalistic element, and Western capitalism. And that, I think, is the way to characterize 2021. It's the, it's the end of Animal Farm when the pigs and the farmers reconcile and get back together again over the heads of the animals. That's the world we're living in in 2021. Okay, let's go to Bristol. That's a very interesting take. I think there's a lot of different ways you could approach that. Jolte, go ahead. You react to that. And, and of course, you know, it's still the original question to you. Go ahead. Oh, well, the thing that I've really noticed about uh, this year is that um, capitalism, imperialism, you can call it ne neoliberalism, but to me, it's simply capitalism with the gloves off. You know, um, what we call neoliberalism, this era when capitalism, imperialism has been taking its gloves off, is really the era of after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Capitalism, the imperialists felt they had to put the gloves on to an extent. They had to grant a lot of concessions to their workers because of the threat of socialism. When they felt that threat recede, they got a huge shot in the arm economically, but also philosophically, they felt emboldened to just do what they wanted to do, to act in accordance with the nature of their system. So I don't really talk about neoliberalism, I just talk about imperialism. Um, and to me, this year has really exposed the total inhumanity and irrationality of the imperialist system. When you have a system where the only rationale for doing anything is will it make a pot of money into a bigger pot of money, and the needs of human beings are nowhere in that equation, um, and then you have the anarchic nature of production, which is totally irrational, we end up with the situation we've seen this year, whereby we had vaccines produced and actually first produced in Russia if there was any sense in the world, the Sputnik vaccine would have been distributed globally immediately and ended the pandemic. But that isn't what happened because there's this competition for, for profiteering out of the health crisis, which distorts all of the actions our governments in the West take. They're, they're looking at this not as a, primarily a health <coughs> issue, but as an issue for business, how to make the most money for big business, for monopoly. And the monopolization of vaccines, you know, the fact that there is this now kind of 
politics of letting letting it run run rampant so there's more variants so there's an ongoing need for vaccines rather than getting it over and done with the fact that um, Western countries won't recognize vaccines that don't come from one of the big monopolies, won't give out vaccines cheaply to people who need them, are hoarding them, are putting terrible conditions onto governments before they will let them buy vaccines, are depriving countries of vaccines. You know, this really shows the true inhumanity of a system that is run for profit. Well, well I think we have a lot, actually, a lot in common. I'm a little bit surprised here. John, I think also, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that the issue of COVID and the vaccines was brought up here. I mean, not only, of course, from a, a, particularly an American perspective, I mean, it's a huge amount of money that's being um, uh, um, drained from, from uh, working people. And at the same time, these lockdowns and mandates are punishment enough. But, John, it's also about expressions of power and being able to um, determine and get your way. I mean, force your will. And, you, and it's legitimized through a health crisis here. And we all, yeah. know, we all know that once you lose those rights, they never come back. They never come back, okay, until they come up with the next, you know, I guess it's going to be the, the new Green Deal crisis, you know, climate, you know, then, again, more rights being denied here. It only goes in one direction, and it seems to me, irrespective of your political coloration, all around the world, you know, a little tyrants enjoyed 2021. John. Yeah, I mean, I uh, agree with some of what the previous speaker said. I I, um, on the other hand, I think that the uh, imperialist, the specifically imperialist dimension is surely on the wane at the moment. Uh, the, the big event of 2021 is surely the retreat from Afghanistan. That is the defeat of imperialism. Um, <clears throat> of course, the mindset persists, but the fact is that uh, the United States, the imperialist power, has been routed. Uh, just as the British Empire was routed in the middle of the 19th century from that country. And instead, uh, what I see, I mean, you know, you mentioned uh, monopolies. Well, firstly, monopolies can't be in the plural by definition. Um, what we see is a terrible uh, collusion between these big pharmaceutical companies, yes, and states, uh, and all in the name of internationalism. In other words, the 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 the, the, the I don't want to be rude, but the rather sort of primitive socialist analysis doesn't really work because you have internationalism and very heavy, massive state involvement. It's the states that are buying the vaccines. It's the states that are forcing the vaccines on people, as Peter says, uh, at the cost of, at the terrible cost of uh, personal liberty. There is a collusion between states and big business, which everyone can see. And that, I'm afraid, doesn't fit into a, a standard socialist uh, analysis, uh, because in the socialist analysis, normally it would be the states that were standing up to the uh, to the big companies. In this case, they are colluding, and they're colluding uh, in a way that is completely compatible with one world uh, globalism, one world internationalism, because everyone's doing the same thing. And in particular, as I said in my first remarks, uh, it's between the, the so-called capitalist West or the so-called West and communist China. That's the collusion. Uh, it's uh, between Western states, uh, communist states and big business. Uh, and they are colluding to establish a world dictatorship. That's really the only way to describe it. John, in, in Bristol, you want to respond to that? Because I think, I think you know, one of the things, and you and I have had a, a conversation in the past, one-on-one, -on -one, remember, remember those days? Um, uh, you know, we, we can go through the lexicon all we want here, but I, 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 I see your point and I see John's here. Go ahead and react to what John just, just said. Go ahead. So imperialism, and I would really recommend to all of you is to go and read Lenin's book on imperialism, because it's not what people commonly imagine. Imperialism is the advanced, most developed stage of capitalism. It's a, it's a world economic system. It is also known as monopoly capitalism. And yes, you're right, the state has become very powerful, but the state is a state of the monopolies. It acts on behalf of the monopolies. And that, as soon as you realize that, you, you understand why it takes the decisions it takes in favor of big business constantly and against the interests of the mass of people who it pretends to be acting on behalf of. It acts on behalf of the monopolies. You know, um, the, the comrade said earlier, sorry, the, the speaker before said earlier that, um, uh, you know, the the way the state behaves is, is kind of socialist. But actually, if you read Capital, if you read Marx, he was pointing out 150 years ago that in the capitalist system, debt is nationalised 
i.e. it's paid for by the working class, profit is privatised, it goes to the wealthy. Uh, and that's exactly the same as we're seeing now, just on a bigger and bigger and bigger scale. Um, and the battle, you were talking about the, the battle for rights of working people seems to go one way, Peter. That's absolutely right. While we have capitalism, the best that workers can do is fight incredibly hard to stand still. And the second they're not fighting incredibly hard, they're going backwards. And even standing still means that more and more of, of a proportion of society's wealth is going to the rich, to the owners of capital. And so even standing still in terms of a, a level of existence means becoming relatively poorer in terms of the amount of society's wealth that comes to the workers. And let's not forget that it's the workers who are producing that wealth. That's what I mean when I talk about this system being absolutely irrational as well as anti-human. Um, you're talking about China. Um, now, there's a lot of confusion about China, but you only have to look at the way that China has managed the health crisis to see that it has absolutely put the people first. They have uh, responded to COVID as a health crisis and put the needs and the health of the people absolutely paramount in everything they've done. As a side effect, their economy has actually fared better. But... It has done so on the basis of taking care of the needs of the people. Yes, China has a huge uh, market element to its economy now, and to that uh, extent, it wants to be accepted as a market economy in the in the in the world institutions that you know are supposed to govern uh, in in any way that that's possible. Uh, the the world's market economy. All right, uh, I'm going to jump in here. We have to go to a hard break, and after that hard break, we'll continue our discussion on 2021 and 2022. Stay with RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing 2021 and 2022. Okay, let's go back to John in Paris. You know, one of the events of 2021 that I found really quite fascinating was this um, rather ridiculous uh, democracy summit, the virtual one, I think everyone remembers here. And, you know, it, it, all of this talk about um, a democracy, but for me, it was just, it was a very, um, very much an ideological show to uh, maintain uh, hegemony because is the, it was presented as, you know, a confident Western led world uh, with the, uh, with the uh, backed by their ideology. Of course, they don't call it neoliberalism, but, you know, they call it democracy, rule of law, all of this type of thing here. But I actually thought it was more of a, uh, um, a virtual presentation out of desperation, that they're losing, uh, they're losing control, okay? And they're trying to maintain a narrative here. And, of course, you know, I mean, you know, everybody likes puppies. Everybody likes democracy. I mean, you know, it's, it's one of the, it's a ridiculous facade for me, and it was a ridiculous exercise. But it was actually, you know, the, the West trying to, you know, make, tell everyone, hey, hey, we're still in control, we're still in control, don't worry, which, of course, is, 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 is actually a demonstration of desperation. Your thoughts, John? Uh, definitely. Um, I, uh, it's important, though, to say that this uh, idea of having alliance of an, uh, an alliance of democracies instead of the multilateral UN system is a very old one. Uh, it goes back uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, and it, was, uh, it reached, I think, its peak uh, under George uh, W. Bush right. uh, and the neocons. But that's 20 years ago now, and it is very much in decline. Um, uh, that's why I mentioned the withdrawal from Afghanistan in, uh, in the first part of the show. Uh, you know, the fact is the Americans were defeated. They have hundreds of military bases all over the world. They are quite clearly an empire. They have the biggest military budget by far. And yet uh, they were unable to uh, defeat the Taliban after 20 years. And that is a major geopolitical event. So, yes, it was a sign of desperation, this democracy summit. It's an attempt to, under, to undermine the multilateral uh, nation-based system of the United Nations and instead to give some kind of preeminence to countries which self-identify, if I may use that word, <laughs> as democratic. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the fact is that Again, I, uh, uh, Jyoti Bra mentioned Marx and Lenin. Uh, Marx 
uh, a lot of what she says is, is correct, uh, in particular, of course, about the sucking out of capital uh, out of ordinary people's pockets. But once again, that is being done by states who are printing money like crazy uh, and thereby uh, inflating away people's uh, savings, for example, and, 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 their, and their salaries. <clears throat> In the case of Marx, Marx predicted and wanted uh, a worldwide capitalist revolution, what he called the international bourgeois revolution, in order to bring about the dictatorship of the proletariat on the world level. He was an internationalist. And yet it is internationalism which is the greatest danger to liberty. And it is nationalism or na uh, a, a, a political system based on nation states which is the best defense of liberty. And that's exactly what we're seeing with the unraveling of the neoconservative project to create an alliance of democracies. The idea was to elbow out other countries like Russia and China in the name of democracy, uh, to elbow out the uh, nation-based United Nations system, and instead to have a uh, hegemony, an ideological and political and military hegemony based around the United States. And that effort has been unraveling now for some years. Uh, and as I say, the Afghanistan debacle is a symbolic, uh, I would say, end really uh, to that adventure. And we are now, I think, back in a multipolar world. And, you know, it's a world in which force counts. And, we, you know, we can see what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. Force is what will decide yes. uh, that particular conflict. Uh, uh, then, as ever, uh, and frankly, I'm, I'm pleased if people start to realize that that is the prime uh, mover behind international relations, not nonsense about demo democracy, which in any case is pretty rich coming from these Western countries who themselves are uh, installing a dictatorship in the name of um, the, of the fight against COVID. Yeah, well, I, I'm sure Julian Assange would have an opinion about the rule of law and democracy exactly. uh, as he's sitting and rotting in prison. Okay, John, I mean, exactly. when, I'm, I'm glad John brought up uh, Afghanistan because, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a strategic defeat. But you know what? It was more than anything else in a much more cynical, vile way. It was a business model that went broke, okay? I mean, they, they, it, it sucked in so much money. Everybody was getting rich. You know, I mean, that, that's what I personally think. That's why I think a lot of people didn't leave when they had the chance to say, no, no, they're, they're never going to leave. I mean, this has been going on for 20, 20 years, and it's been such a great moneymaker for so many people involved in it. And then it all came crashing down to an end. Though the, 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 that kind of project, the, the, the global hegemonic project uh, of the U.S. military is far, far from over. I mean, and as John brought up, I mean, uh, Ukraine is on the menu now, okay? These people don't give up here. I mean, and that's the kind of thing that I, what I find really quite disturbing, and I tend to obviously side with John here, is that you know you they, they're sidelining the United Nations. They're pushing out people, uh, uh, major important countries in the world that uh, play an important role in the world stage. But they're just vanished. They're not part of uh, allowed to be ha communion in the church, as it were. I mean, they, these are, this is a model that it, that will never uh, cease until it's completely destroyed or bankrupts itself. Go ahead in in, in Brussels in Bristol. So um, I was listening to John uh, talking about the defeat for. Uh, imperialism in Afghanistan, and he's absolutely right. It's a world historic moment. Um, we have been watching f for 20 or more years the um, un untrammeled aggression of the imperialist states and the US uh, leading the charge, uh, and their desire to take back control of all the places in the world that had in some way resisted them, uh, their domination and their total exploitation and subjugation. Um, the defeat in Afghanistan is is huge. You know, 20 years of money, material and resources failed to subdue the Afghan people. And it's interesting that he's talked about, you know, China colluding with the US because really we're seeing the exact opposite. The, the primary targets of the ire and the and the aggression uh, of the USA and the imperialists are Russia and China, precisely because they don't submit, they stand up for themselves and for their people and for their own independence and for their own right to sovereignty uh, and, and, to, and to run their countries in the way that their people see fit. And um, China and Russia, and China in particular when it comes to Afghanistan, are offering 
Many countries, and it's one of the reasons they, they come in for so much ire from the USA, they're offering people an alternative to the neoliberal debt trap uh, and total subjugation model that imperialism offers. They share technology, they build infrastructure, they lend at very low rates, they help countries really lift themselves up for the benefit of their people and for the mutual trading benefit of all. Um, this is a, a threat to the ability of the USA to control the world. And that's why China is so much in the sights of the USA. Um, the, the propaganda offensive takes many forms. And in particular, this democracy summit really has to be seen as a part of the propaganda offensive against China. It's part of the softening up of the populations in the West for war against China and against yeah. Russia letting us feel that these people are bad, they're our enemies. That's why they use words like totalitarian, you know, and are constantly trying to tell us that genocides are happening, that the people who are under attack are aggressive. You know, China and Russia don't ever go beyond their borders. They don't have bases all over the world. It's, it's the USA that's surrounding China and surrounding Russia with its aggressive bases. But we are being given this fairy tale that China is aggressive and Russia is aggressive to soften us up for war. Yeah, well, you know, now that we're talking about both Russia and China, John, and you said in your last answer, you know, force decides things. Unfortunately, I absolutely agree with you because that's where we stand right now. And I unfortunately believe in 2022, we're going to see a lot of force and it's going to be very, very ugly. And Jolte is absolutely right. I mean, if I would just rephrase it, I mean, you know, there's, it's always a purity test. That's why I, I mentioned this, this democracy summit. There, you have to be pure or you're, 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 you're not, um, you're, you're thrown away. You're thrown uh, to the wolves. You're not allowed to uh, have your own existence. And we're, we're getting that. We're at that point right now. We're at the Rubicon right now as we speak. Go ahead, John. Well, I think we may be at the Rubicon, yes, but I'm actually relatively optimistic. Of course, I agree with Jyoti about the imperialism of the United States. I've been denouncing it for 20 years. Uh, of course, I agree that they are encircling Russia and so on. Um, however, if you look at the Ukraine crisis, Russia is accused of being about to in, uh, invade Ukraine. Uh, the West has said what? The West has said it's not going to fight to save Ukraine. It's going to put sanctions on Russia. Well, that's an admission of defeat, because if tomorrow Russia were to invade Ukraine and get sanctions put on it, uh, Russia would be the overall winner, however painful the sanctions might be. The West has already raised the white flag. And as far as China is concerned, yes, there's a lot of rhetoric against China, but we have to see in 2022 uh, how it pans out. You know, uh, I said that the I've been saying for months the litmus test would be the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. Well, it's been built. OK, it's not in operation yet, but it's been built against in the teeth of American opposition. Uh, I suspect it will probably go on stream pretty soon. Uh, and the, the rhetoric against China, uh, it's a little bit similar. Uh, we'll have to see, you know, is it all mouth and no trousers? Because it comes against a background of many decades of collusion with China. All right. Um, uh, of which, again, Joe Biden is the is the is the emblematic expression. So we'll have to see. Does it translate into anything? Uh, I suspect it may not translate into very much. I'm not convinced that there will be a war uh, against uh, China or Russia. I think, on the contrary, the West at the moment is on the back foot, and I think we maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I think we do see now a return to the multilateralism which. Uh, Russia, in particular, has been asking for now for, for well over a decade. Jyoti, I'll give you the last 25 seconds of the program. Go right ahead. Thanks. Uh, John's absolutely right. Force is the ultimate decider. So we should be very glad that the anti-imperialist camp is strong enough to defend itself and fight back. We only need to look at the difference between what has happened to North Korea and what happened to Libya to understand what happens when... Uh, People who want to be independent disarm themselves. Okay. Very two, two tragic examples to think of at the same time here as we close out the year. Many thanks to my guests in Paris and in Bristol, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, crosstalk rules.